A very warm welcome to IDFC First Bank Presents Leaders of Tomorrow Season 11. I'm Ritvika Gupta. Tonight, we're bringing you an exclusive conversation with Nadir Godrej, Managing Director, Godrej Industries. He speaks to me about opportunities and challenges for new India, leadership, and his love for poetry. Take a look. Godrej Industries, founded in 1897, has since grown to become one of India's most prominent business groups with a presence in over 80 countries worldwide. Operating in a variety of industries including consumer goods, real estate, finance and agriculture, Godrej Industries is known for its commitment to sustainability with initiatives in areas such as renewable energy, waste reduction and water conservation. Today, I caught up with Nadir Godrej, who currently serves as Managing Director of Godrej Industries and Chairman of Godrej Agrovet. He spoke to me about how India is being perceived as a promising business destination by the global community and the ideas that can help shape new India. It's a pleasure having you on the show, Mr. Godrej. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Ritvika. It's a pleasure being here. So, you know, it's not every day that I get to have a lengthy conversation with you. So I do have a lot of questions. So please allow me. Sure. Starting with, uh, you know, to really understand um, what are your big ideas for new India uh, in terms of how India can really cement its position um, globally? Uh, one idea is that India can push the sustainability agenda. And India is actually doing that through the G20. That's a very important idea. And also inclusivity. India has done a lot on inclusivity, and we need to do more. And India can also lead the world uh, in that. And I hope we continue on that journey as well. Our economic growth is outstanding, especially in these troubled times. Of course, we will face some challenges, but we have a good chance of pulling out of that. And we need to continue on the agenda of reform, and deregulation. At the same time, we must have safety regulation. We saw that there's another banking crisis coming up and India should make sure that that doesn't happen. India should make sure that corporate governance is good and so that we don't have problems on that front. And I think India can contribute a lot to the world. Wonderful. Picking up from what you said, I'm keen to understand how does the world view India currently um, in terms of it being a promising destination for investments? What can you tell us? India is really on the world's uh, radar screen right now. Even when we went to Davos, uh, the Indian presence could be felt. Uh, many Indian state governments were there, lots of Indians could be seen on the street. Right. Even um, uh, part of the diaspora could be seen in uh, Davos, not all Indians from India. So yeah. India's influence in the world is very large. We see the leaders of many companies, many of the new tech companies, as well as the presidents and deans of uh, universities all over the world are Indians, so India has a very important role to play. Of course, we are now the most populous country in the world. Yeah. Uh, our economic uh, economy is not as big as our population, mm -hmm. but we are slowly getting there and we need to go on this journey. And I hope that with the numbers being what they are, with our development being what it is, we have the potential to be world leaders. I hope we are caring and kind leaders of the world. Right, absolutely. You know, uh, Mr. Godrej, with the rising inflation and uh, this global recession and the economic slowdown, how do you think this will impact your business and um, what are your strategies to stay ahead in the game? Most Indian businesses are very resilient. The effects of these factors have not been as big on India as in other countries. When we, there were supply chain disruptions, uh, we found that exports were affected but uh, import substitution was given a boost. Right. So Indian companies have been able to adjust to these situations. Even the pandemic, which could have been debilitating and was in many countries, yes. hardly affected India because Indian companies were very resilient. Workers were living in the factory and working from there. Uh, white collar workers were working from home. So, uh, and we have to maintain this resilience. We cannot predict all the crises that are going to be coming, 
but we can certainly quickly react to them and make the most of them. Right. You know, at Davos, you um, spoke about, you know, climate change. You presented a poem. Um, I'm keen to understand how does Goldridge as a company view sustainability and if you could talk about some of the environmental initiatives that you have, you know, undertaken. Right. So, uh, sustainability has been very important for us uh, right from our beginnings. And, uh, for example, on environmental sustainability, my uncle Saurabh Godrej was very interested in uh, the environment. And he was one of the initiators of the Save the Tiger program. He made sure that our mangroves here were preserved. Mm -hmm. they, are, they belong to a trust. They no longer belong to the company. And so there were all these initiatives taken for the environment, yeah. which uh, we have uh, continued. Also on social sustainability, we, my grandfather bought this land in uh, Vikroli uh, because he visited a worker who was living in terrible conditions. So he thought that if he had a lot of land, he could build spacious factories, he could have housing, he could build a school, and we have a school here in Vic Rowley, and all this was because of my grandfather's vision. When he bought this land, people thought he was mad. They said, at that time it was in the boondocks, and now it's in the center of Mumbai. So yeah. he was a visionary, and uh, we have all these benefits uh, that come from sustainability. And I have a little poem here, if you don't mind my reciting. Of course, of course not. For health, as well as climate change, it certainly isn't strange that prevention's better than cure. On public health, we should spend. It is much cheaper in the end. With little cost and greatest ease, we could reduce lifestyle disease. At any rate, I am quite sure, in order to achieve this goal, businesses could play a role. Through business models and CSR, together we can go quite far. And similarly, through education, we can serve ourselves and the nation. Through action and advocacy, we can help all humanity to create a world that's just and fair and everyone is free to share nature's bounty and be fulfilled. And then I'm sure we'd all be thrilled. Ingeniously, we can plan it, serve profit, people and planet. Sustainability is not a pain. For after all, it is a gain. It helps us all to survive, last long, as well as to thrive. It's a license to operate. The ecosystem finds it great. Society, governments, banks, cooperate, convey their thanks. With ESG spends, nothing's lost, as benefits outweigh the cost. The strategy is tried and tested. In the long haul, it can't be bested. Now sustainability will take you far. Don't just be a shooting star, rising high before you fall. Instead, take the enduring call. All of us can forge ahead if we only learn to shed the barriers that can divide and if cooperation stride with the help of business, I foresee a helpful, thriving society. Wonderful. You know, before I get to my next set of questions, I actually want to understand your love for poetry. Where did that come from? Well, um, I always had a love for literature and drama as well. Mm -hmm. And I, in my college days, I used to act as well. Wonderful. And a lot of it comes from my mother and my maternal grandmother. My maternal grandmother studied English literature. She went to college way back in the early 1900s when very few girls were in college. There were so few girls in the college that the nine of them had a common room as big as the boys' common room. Wow. And she said she used to play rounders there because oh, <laughs> the room was so huge. Uh, but she had a love for poetry and she used to recite poetry and she used to write poems for the Indian independence movement. Nice. So I grew up with a love for poetry and one day I decided to make a speech in verse. It was at the Economic Times Harvard Business School uh, Awards at that time. It was a joint venture and I was representing Harvard Business School. Wonderful. And I had to give a vote of thanks, which I decided to give as a poem. I was in Calcutta and the Calcutta audience uh, really enjoyed that. And then I said, maybe I should try that more often. <laughs> Wonderful. It's time for a quick break here. We'll be back shortly. Stay tuned. What do you think are the major challenges that may come in between India and its dream to become a $5 trillion economy? Perhaps the biggest challenges are self-imposed. 
if we don't reform, and uh, reform doesn't mean over, it means deregulation, but not over deregulation. Welcome back. You're watching IDFC First Bank Presents, Leaders of Tomorrow, Season 11. And right now, I'm in conversation with Nadir Godrej, Managing Director, Godrej Industries. Listen in. Well, shifting my focus a little bit, um, I want to try and understand, you know, uh, a little bit about the businesses, you know, that are that come under you. Starting with uh, Godrej Agrovet, um, talk to us a little bit about, you know, how the business has been shaping up, and I'm right. also keen to understand the Samadhan initiative, you know, that has been designed to really empower farmers, you know, in terms of financial security, education. Uh, what can you tell us? Right. Uh, Agrovet has been facing some challenges this year, particularly in our milk business. Yeah. There were challenges in our crop protection uh, business as well, but that is improving steadily uh, because of uh, unseasonal weather and uh, uh, irregular monsoons. Okay. Uh, we did have too much stock and a lot of outstandings, but we've tightened things and this year looks like developing much better. In oil palm, in earlier in the year, we had very high palm oil prices, which was of great benefit. Since then, palm oil prices have fallen considerably. But the government has introduced a new palm oil policy, which means that we can grow very rapidly. And we are growing rapidly. Our nurseries are expanding. We'll be planting a lot more trees this year, or rather, we'll be producing them in the nursery, and the farmers will be planting them. And some other centers have been made so that we can teach the farmers how to grow the new palms, also how to take care of the old palms and increase the productivity, increase the oil content. We're doing a lot of research and we are extending this to the farmers and that is the objective of Samadhan. And I think that in 15 to 20 years, India could be self-sufficient in vegetable oils if we expand both oil palm and uh, rapeseed, both of which have a lot of potential to stop our huge imports of vegetable oil. It will take a long time. Palm, oil palm trees take five years to grow before they yield. And of course, rapeseed can be grown faster, but oil palm has even more potential than rapeseed has. Right. Uh, speaking about your chemical business, um, talk to us about some of the growth prospects that you see in that area. Yeah. Now that business has expanded tremendously in the last two years. Mm -hmm. Not so much in terms of volume, because we are at full capacity, but profitability has improved considerably. The global situation has affected some of our businesses, but has seemed to be a boom to this business. Uh, we don't know what will happen in the future. There may be more challenges because capacity is tight, so people are thinking of expanding. Sure. But we also have an initiative to move into specialty chemicals. Okay. And we will also have to change. We will have to have more of a consumer uh, touch in the uh, specialty business because you have to make the product exactly according to the uh, customer's needs. Even in our basic chemicals, they act a bit like specialties because our customers require very special specifications and we are in a position to uh, uh, provide it to them. Although fatty alcohols and fatty acids are very basic oleochemicals, we have a big emphasis on products made from rapeseed oil. And other countries have to grow higher use rapeseed oil on purpose. They don't grow it normally. But in India, all our rapeseed oil is higher use. So we have a big advantage. And earlier, Indian costs were higher because import duties on oil were high, but now the import duties are lower, mm -hmm. and India is very, very competitive, and that gives us an excellent advantage. Right. Mr. Godrej, our show is also about, you know, empowering smaller, medium-sized businesses. I want to understand, you know, uh, what sort of a role do you think Godrej Capital can play in terms of really improving financing for MSMEs, you know, to really make the sector strong and resilient? They're very focused on helping uh, SMEs. 
and the, they have come up with a good scheme whereby you can choose your repayment pattern. They have an app which tells you if you want to pay less in the beginning and more later, mm -hmm. that can easily be adjusted. Uh, many borrowers don't like equated monthly installments. They would rather like to have their own pattern which fits their business needs. Sure. And Godrich Capital with this app can really facilitate this. They are increasing their geographical expansion and they are increasing the kinds of finance they are doing. They started off as a housing finance company, yeah. but they're rapidly moving into other areas, often in adjacencies which reflect the interests of the group. For instance, they're doing agricultural lending, they're doing distributor lending, but ultimately there will be a broad-based finance company. Right. So, you know, I read another poem of yours. It was called uh, A Biography of Innovations. And you mentioned something really interesting, like the greatest thing since the sliced bread is uh, innovation widely spread. So tell me, how does Godrej view innovation and, you know, in terms of really integrating technology and R&D, you know, into your company? Uh, what role does R&D play? Yeah, R&D plays a very big role, but other kinds of innovation also play a big role. We encourage everyone to innovate. We try to give people freedom, including freedom to fail. We don't punish failure as long as people learn from their failure. And the emphasis on R&D has been greatly increased. My good friend Naushad Forbes has written a book about the issues of India. And one of the things he says is we are doing far too little R&D mm. in India. And there is a lot of potential to do more. Uh, unfortunately, the universities don't do a lot of R&D. We do have good national institutes to do R&D, and businesses can certainly do more R&D. We find excellent returns to R&D, and we have upped our spendings. In the next week, we are going to open a new R&D center for agrochemicals at Rabale, uh, about half an hour from here, uh, where we will try and produce new plat agrochemicals based on new platforms. We are very strong in triazoles, but we are going to try three other platforms. And this is a state-of-the-art facility uh, on which we have been very careful to do everything in the best possible way. And the future is very bright there. In our oleo chemicals business, we have expanded R&D and we are doing a lot of work on biologicals. Along with the National Chemical Laboratory, we developed sophorolipids. And sulfurolipids are amazing surfactants. They are, uh, they are natural surfactants produced by yeast. So we grow yeast in fermenters. We feed them vegetable oils and they produce the sulfurolipid, uh, which not only is a powerful surfactant, which can be used in small doses, mm -hmm. but it acts as an antiviral and an antibacterial because of its surface active properties. It actually disrupts the walls of uh, bacteria. Right. So, Mr. Godrej, tell us, what do you think are the major challenges that may come in between India and its dream to become a $5 trillion economy? The path is very clear for India. I don't see a lot of challenges. Perhaps the biggest challenges are self-imposed. If we don't reform, and uh, reform doesn't mean over, it means deregulation, but not over deregulation. We need guide rails, safety guide rails, so it's a fine balance, and it's tricky. It's not easy to do. But if we get that right, we can grow even faster. 10% is potentially possible. And if we do that, we will uh, reach developed status in 10 or 15 years. Fantastic. And finally, as we wrap up this conversation, tell me, as a leader, what have been your biggest learnings over the years? Biggest learnings is to take everybody along with you. Uh, the, the military style of leadership is very old-fashioned, probably works very well on the battlefield, but we are no longer on battlefields. Yeah. Uh, we are in a world uh, of a knowledge economy, and all our employees have a lot of knowledge. We have to draw on their wisdom, not on the leader's wisdom, and that to me is the biggest learning. <laughs> Fantastic. It was lovely chatting with you. Thank you Thank so you. much. It was a pleasure. With that, it's a wrap on this episode of IDFC First Bank Presents Leaders of Tomorrow Season 11. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. Thank you and goodbye.